Entonces, um, muchas gracias de ser aquí. Uh, de nuevo, disculpa para no hablar uh, castellano propio. Uh, entonces, uh, in English, um, okay, um, so I've been tasked uh, with making a, a kind of an update on the state of the situation on so many uh, complex and critical issues, such as uh, surveillance, oppression, what was it again, data protection, that it is, it is an impossible task to summarize all of this. So I thought that this, it would be an occasion to to try and, and think a bit of, about ourselves and think a bit about our movements because this is, to me, what the Free Culture Forum is, is about. It's a moment in time, a moment in the year where we can gather and think about strategy. And I think this is something extremely precious that we usually don't take enough time to do. So, to the, the image of this Free Culture Forum, uh, I think we can, we can think of global strategies by looking at ourselves and by looking at the Free Culture Forum itself. Six years ago, some of us who are in this room were here already. We were m merely uh, a forum wanting culture to be free. A, a forum projecting a vision about culture being free. Along the years, this turned into a forum where we practiced and we organized free culture. By learning about ourselves, by strategizing, we became somehow an institution. And today, I think we meet in this free culture forum, not only to, to, to want, not only to project a vision, not only to organize, but to grow and spread what has become a culture of freedom. This is what we are into today, whether we come from the field of access to medication, fight against corruption, free software, free hardware, whether we are journalists, students, or any, any, anyone else. We are here to share a, a common culture of freedom, to spread it, to grow it, and to organize it. And this is the lessons we've learned when our dear Free Culture Forum uh, pushed by those amazing people at Xnet, uh, also did their own transition. You may remember that in 2009, the Free Culture Forum was organized by XGAE. XGAE was taking one very concrete point of action, how corrupt XGAE was and how much blockade to access to culture it, it created, and from then on grew into an institution of its own that is about to participate in solving so many problems of society. I think this is to the image of our movements. I wanted to do this very difficult exercise of trying to look at all the positive aspects of our movements. In a moment in time where many of us activists and citizens feel gloomy, have the impression that it gets harder and harder to fix anything, some of us even have an impression that we are losing it. Some of us don't know what to do. I think, again, these kind of feelings, these kind of moments, call for a, a long-term strategic vision. For that, I think we need to, to look as long as we can in the past and project ourselves as long as we can in the future. And this is, again, what we are doing here. Um, to me, the more I, I'm able to take a distance from the everyday operations of uh, an organization defending freedoms online, fighting in the parliaments, fighting the, 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 the governments, the more I see that our strategies go along three avenues. Sometimes those avenues meet, sometimes they part. Of course, they communicate together by perpendicular streets. One is, of course, the political and legislative avenue. Another one is, of course, the technological avenue. And the third one, aha, a little bit of suspense here. Uh, the political and legislative avenue is the one we've worked the most. Uh, some of us here crawled the European Parliament uh, until we got nauseated. Uh, we knocked every door 
on the European Commission, on the Council, on the Permanent Representation, on the Council of Europe. We, we, we got sick of all those names and piled those business cards and hoped and tried so much. We earned major victories. We also suffered major losses. Uh, the main losses are all the ones we didn't fight because we didn't have enough re resources. All those legislative dossiers where we didn't even know they were happening, whether it was strictly speaking about defending freedoms online or even if it was about energy or health or ecology, I mean, w this is also what we're all about. But along those victories and those defeats, we learned and we learned tremendously. We learned by being in contact with the institution, by trying the institution, by poking the institution, sometimes with a stick, sometimes trying to throw carrots at it. We gain a tremendous capacity of analysis that is now part of our skills, that is now part of our genes. This is not what we can do individually and collectively. Bring that draft legislation. Let's take a stopwatch and see how long it takes before the analysis publish a peer-reviewed analysis with comments and all the shit. We know how to do this. Skill learned. But it is not only by poking the institution and being in contact with the institution that we learn the most on the political avenue. We also learned a lot by thinking out of the institution, by being out of the institution, by maintaining this capacity of staying out of the institution, by being true to our school, yo, by being true to ourselves, by never forgetting who we are and where we come from. We managed to stay out of the institution with our integrity while documenting how corrupt the institution may be from the inside. From this ability, we gain not only the ability to, to formulate propositions and to be able to word propositional agenda like, like no one. Yesterday at the, the Free Culture Forum, of course those documents were drafted before, but we came with an agreement on what, 30 pages, 40 pages of text? And again, we have this skill, we have this ability. Give Simona and the others, I don't know, 10,000 euros, they will fly people from 50 different countries. And during three days, we can write as many hundred pages of propositional agenda as, as we can until the, the ink goes dry, until we, we fall asleep. But also what we learn is this ability to be the institution. And this is something we too often neglect and we too often forget to look at for what it really is. Let's try one, one minute to count the institutions that we, the internet, built over the last 10 years. We built a Wikipedia, we built a GNU, we built a Wikileaks, we built an Xnet, we built La Quadrature du Net, we built an EDRI, we built an EFF, okay, EFF and GNU may be more than 10 years old, but, but look at us, look at us. We don't need no parliament, we don't need no constitution, we don't need no election. All we need is a bit of a server, some code, and some, uh, some caffeine. <laughs> and give me a wiki, give me a mailing list, and, and I give you an institution. This is the way we do it. This is, this is, again, a tremendous skill we've learned that is now part of a culture, that is part of our genes, that defines who we are, and that we must, must be immensely proud of. Now, let's not uh, hide ourselves. In the last five years, we lost. On net neutrality, maybe Thomas will tell us more about it uh, later on, we, we had a major defeat a few days ago. A major defeat which actually may be only 60% of a victory. When we started eight years ago, La, Quad La Quadrature du Net, we started, I, I, I sent a note to the European Parliament on August 25th of 2008 called Save Net Neutrality in the Telecoms Package. At this day, we were zero, ground level of net neutrality. On first reading two years ago, we achieved 100%. And this is a victory that still today we need to celebrate. With last week's vote, 
we went down maybe to 60, 70 percent. So it's only a bit more than half a victory, but still. What we learned along those years is that our enemies have an infinite capacity of adaptation, along with an infinite budget. When five years ago, we fought against discrimination of our communication, discrimination of our access, now violations of net neutrality take the form of paid peering, of fast lane, of um, uh, uh, zero, uh, zero rating offers. If you don't know about those terms, no big deal. We can speak about it later. That's not my point. Our enemies have an infinite budget with which they can adapt. And we must learn from that. So we are facing this major political crisis and this major democratic crisis. More and more of our peers don't give a fuck anymore about parliaments, about elected representatives, and about elections. This is also something we have to take into account in our strategies on the political and the legislative avenue. Because the less legitimacy those institutions will have, the less agency we will have in these institutions, and the less agency we will have through these institutions. And so we see new tactics emerging. The brilliant work of Max Schrems in Europe versus Facebook just came to a major victory. And this is a non-legislative victory. This is a litigating victory. And we see litigating strategies emerging everywhere, including in France, where La Quadrature, and this is a new tactic for us, uh, challenged 10 different pieces of law and administrative text before the highest administrative court with tremendous work of volunteer lawyers. And this is new to us. Also, what, what was it in my notes? Oh, yeah. Civil disobedience. Where to put it? Is that a political slash legislative avenue bit? I think it is. I think it is. I think civil disobedience is the politics of those who politics failed. Those who were failed, who were betrayed by politics. It is sad, but on copyright, if the commission is not about to reopen the InfoSoc directive, if we're not about to have a positive reform enacted into law, if we are not nearing victory on a copyright regime that would be fair for everyone, all we are left with is civil disobedience. And organizing this civil disobedience is what we can do and is also a skill we've learned. Okay, now for the technological avenue, one that bears maybe the most promises as of today. Uh, I hate to speak of post-Snowden, after Snowden, because Snowden is not dead, not yet. He wasn't hit by a drone yet, and it's not even funny. Snowden is alive, free, and well, and he's tweeting, maybe a bit too much, but Snowden is alive and we must celebrate that we are in the era of Snowden, not at all post-Snowden. This era of the Snowden sounds a bit like the age of the Aquarius. Ah, oh, makes me think of another song. <laughs> when the moon... No, sorry. <laughs> and I'm not even drunk yet. So in the, edge, in the age of Snowden, we learned one major lesson. Is that technology betrayed us. Technology failed us. Trust is forever broken in most software, hardware, routers, services that we use every day. Those computers that are in our pockets, in our watches, in our fridges, in our glasses, in our cars, in our planes, in our buildings, all those computers have been turned into our enemies. They've been turned into tools of control in the hands of their real masters. It's not only PRISM, it's the Bull Run program, in which the NSA invested $250 million per year to corrupt every technology supposed to protect our communications and our data through infiltrating development teams through infiltrating standard bodies, through plain old corruption, like giving $10 million to RSA so they would leave some security holes open. Every bit of technology that we think we own is actually owned by this opponent that is a 
ill-defined alliance of the NSA, the Five Eyes, and all its myriad of public and private partners, those million individuals working against us, turning technology into uh, our, our enemy. It is all about trust, and it is all about this trust we lost. It is all about reinventing this trust. And it will take tremendous effort. It is exhilarating because we are getting there. And here again, we are building a common understanding of the objectives. The objectives, I think, are of three major, um, there are three major lanes in the technological avenue. Free software, free libre software, indeed, with no compromise. Software that we can understand, that we collectively own. Software over which humanity as a whole has an agency. Software that we can maybe someday trust is the only way. But software we can trust must run on hardware we can trust. And here we have an industrial challenge of tremendous proportion that maybe some of the biggest countries in the world still have a capacity to address. So free Libre software running on free Libre hardware with decentralized services. So we are in control of the infrastructure. And only with end-to-end -end encryption, not to be uh, misunderstood for point-to-point -point encryption, with end-to-end -end encryption, we control the keys. We are in control. It's only when technology responds to those three characteristics together that we have a faint hope someday of taking back control. But what we need is not just development. We don't need just lines of code. For years, we knew that free software is not code. Free software is code, is graphic design, is web design, is documentation, is promotion, is user uh, interaction and, and feedback and organizing of communities. But what we know now is that free software is also security auditing, black box auditing that is missing on each and every free software project I know. It's 10 times more resources that we have today that we need just for the development alone and 10 times more resources than we have that we need for the auditing of this development. So we need to develop free technology, but we also need to develop the development of free technology. And this is very concrete demands we can do on a European level, on national level, on a city level. And we'll see what Ada Colau will do with the recommendation we, we gave her this morning. We'll see if an entity as strong and true to its school as Barcelona seemed to be, can do with its resources to foster freedom of its citizens and the technological freedom of its citizens. So the third avenue, I mentioned the third avenue with great suspense, remember, is the one I think we neglected the most when I describe we as everyone but the Spanish part of our family. Um, it's the cultural avenue. Because let's face it, internet activists, political activists here started with culture. When the rest of the, in the rest of the world, uh, political activists are kind of discovering now that, oh wow, John Oliver talking about dick pics is maybe making more about surveillance than we ever done. Again, John Oliver speaking of net neutrality triggers three million replies from citizens on the net neutrality consultation by the FCC when all the activists together before triggered what? 5,000, 10,000? So I'm convinced that it is by the cultural tactics that we will not only foster and encourage the political tactics, but also the technological tactics. The, the cultural bits of our agenda, the cultural avenue is where so much of the energy can be channeled that it will inevitably radiate, irradiate on the other avenues. And the great thing about it is that this is the avenue where we have the, the most joy 
and the most fun. And this is one of the key characteristics to our movement. When we do it, what we do with passion and, and an open heart, and we're still having fun doing it, we are unstoppable. When we stop having fun, this is where shit hits the fan. This is when we start nearing burnout. This is when we start being sad. This is when we start looking at the world in a gloomy way. This is where we can't find help. So we need more of those uh, funny narratives about dick pics. We need more cat pictures. We need more remixes. We need more crazy songs. We need more naked people doing happenings in the streets. We need people sending confetti. Hobbyist adversaries don't have that. They have elements of language. They have talking points. What we have is a vision. And this is extremely precious. And this is something that we share like a present between each other. And this is something that we must never forget to share and take the time to share. We have this ability, I said that earlier, to create institutions. Boom, a wiki, boom, an institution. We can create institutions in order to organize and coordinate. Because you all know that this is where very often we, we, we lack uh, energy, we lack resources. So let's create more institutions whenever we feel we have something to organize. And it's no big deal if nobody uses the mailing list, if the, 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 the wiki stays unguarded. At least we do it, at least we can do it. We also have this fantastic ability to think out of the box, out of the institution. And this is something we must cherish in all of the avenues. This is our, this is our modus vivendi. This is how we live our movements, with vision, with our own institutions, and out of the box. Now, the, the modus operandi, the way we should be doing it, is also very specific to, to us, I think. We do it by adapting. And by adapting movements, institutions, uh, thinking, the tactics, and by adapting them all the times. Our opponents need a yearly meeting of the board and ask to some levels of executive blah, 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 and blah. When we can improvise, sometimes, use our guts, use our feelings, use our emotions, ask around. And we have this ability to very quickly adapt. But this is something we must never forget to do. Because the risk is to get too comfortable with doing what we do and what we do good. And by doing that, we often miss to do what we could be doing and what we could be doing even better than what we are used to do good. Also, a great and a fan fantastic characteristic of our movements is that we are able to think in the long term. When Richard Stallman thought of the GNU in 1982, he knew it was a political project. It was a project for society. And the GNU is still standing today, strong and alive, stronger than ever. Our vision is projected into the future, not into the next financial quarter, not into the next electoral term. And this is a great strength, again, that we have over our opponents. And last but not least, our movements are born and thrive in passion. Passion is the fuel of our movements. Passion is what we share in those events and after when we drink all night and sing and dance 
and share this human energy that we have all together. So I think that if we keep that in mind, and if we keep practicing this every day, and if we remember that we are all here for each other to share those values with joy, then I think victory is inevitable. We are doing it. Gracias. Gracias. Now, let's save some precious time for the interventions for, yeah. from our precious contributors. Um, we have some of the most amazing activists uh, in the world here in this room. Um, and they all have um, inputs to, to provide. Uh, and I would, I would ask them this uh, difficult uh, exercise of trying to, to project yourself in a strategic way. Not, it doesn't have to be what you are working on right now, but what you, you hope you will be working in one year in two years, in five years from now. Uh, Jamie? Uh, James, if you don't mind, maybe we could, we could start with you, uh, because I think you're the one who came the, 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 from the longest distance, because you're also maybe one that initially was maybe the further away from, from our communities with your, your fight of uh, access to medication and your fight for patents. And, and well, you're such an inspiration for all of us. I learned about ACTA from, from you. Uh, what is your strategic vision for, for your future? If you could keep it under five minutes, it would be, it would be wonderful. Oh, it, Simona says three, let's say four. Um, I know it's hard, but... Maybe uh, you're three minutes. a specialist of trade agreements, um, of WIPO, of patents. Well, uh, sure, okay. Um, well, a as you know, one of the um, challenges people have are, are related to the uh, issues about both the surveillance and the secrecy of the negotiations. And so a, a lot of issues about intellectual property rights are not, dis are not, are not uh, decided at the national level. I mean, many are, but there's uh, the, the trade agreements are attempts to fashion very durable norms outside of normal political processes negotiated in secret, but it's not, as you know, it's not truly secret because there's a, uh, a system, it, certainly formally in the United States, where hundreds of people that are, are corporate lobbyists have access to the details of the negotiation. And informally, there's quite a bit of briefing of industry uh, lobbyists all along on these things. And the general public is deliberately uh, with, they withhold the details. And so if the civil society wants to criticize an agreement, a, a common reframe of the uh, trade, trade officials in, in Europe and the United States is to say that uh, you don't know what you're talking about, that, uh, you know, or, or that's an old text, or how do you know that's true, or something like that. So it's, it's, it's really, it's not about keeping the secrets from the countries, because the countries all have copies of the text. It's not about keeping it from special interests, because they all have copies of the text. The only person that doesn't have copies of the text are people in this room. I mean, it's, it's designed to... And, and even if you do get a copy of the text, it's, 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 a, it's a way of uh, claiming that you don't know what you're talking about, even if you do get a copy. So it's all about marginalizing civil society. So that's the problem. The other problem is that after Snowden's revelations, the society believes that the, uh, I mean, the negotiators believe that they're being monitored so closely, they don't want to share and leak documents to, often to uh, civil society because they're afraid that... Uh, uh, that the, the ability of surveillance is possibly even more and greater than, than, than what's actually happening. So it has a, uh, an effect of cutting off the flow of information. So that's, that's one thing. Another thing I think is important, though, in terms of approaching these negotiations is to take the people that do it, who are personalities uh, and individuals, and uh, not just talk about DG Trade or, or you know, InfoSoc, but, but to name the people on the Council of Europe, name the actual ministers themselves, the, the staff people, to personalize and make them accountable. Because these, these institutions, I mean, they're, they're shaped by a lot of big and personal forces, but they're also people that take responsibility for the actions. And, 
and, and to make people more accountable for the anti-democratic, anti-transparency uh, views and things like that. So um, I think that, that, that these are the, 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 the big threat, like the Trade Secret Directive in Europe, which is a sweeping definition of what's confidential. They want to criminalize access to information. They want to make, they want to give the status of information that companies just find embarrassing to the uh, formula for making Coca-Cola as if they're really the same thing, and they're not. And they, they, you know, they want information about health risks, about what causes cancer, about how much money they give to a politician. They want all of that stuff really secret, protected, jail sanctions, in free, you know, all sorts of ramped up in enforcement agendas. And for those things to move forward, it, it really is a, an additional chilling of access to knowledge, of your ability to participate and, 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 and to uh, contribute to the process. And I think that, that, that people have to be shamed. People, this morning there was all this talk about corruption here uh, at, at the level. And I think that it's accurate to describe what takes place in the trade negotiation as a very uh, uh, transparent form of corruption. I mean, it's essentially you're, you're, you're seeing the influence of corrupt influences on politics in plain day, and they're not even ashamed of it. And I, and I think that using the language of corruption is helpful because I think it accurately describes what's going on. Thank you so much. Um, Una cosa, no denunciéis vuestro profesor de inglés porque su inglés realmente es difícil, ¿eh? No sé si habéis entendido poco, luego re, repasamos el vídeo. Uh, Renata, uh, maybe, uh, sorry, Jimmy, I should have asked you this as well. Maybe you, you could come and sit here so everybody will, will see you. Yeah, it's, it's good. Nicer, when you answer to, since it's in English, it's easier <laughs> at least you turn around. If you want to tell us maybe, I don't know, you, you have a perspective coming from Latin America. You work with whistleblowers and with WikiLeaks. You, you do so much epic shit, Renata. What is your, <laughs> oh, what, what are your, your, your strategic right. objectives for, for okay. the future? If she Setup. Everybody understands English because there is translation for those okay, who don't so understand. So, English. and it's English. recorded in English. Yeah. So okay. Excuse my bad English, then. That's my fault. I take responsibility. Yes, but my French is worse, and my, my Catalan non-existent. So um, quickly, I think that the most important. I have two objectives in the uh, midterm. And um, after the Snowden, I, I, will, I will go step back after the Assange experience on Ecuador granting him asylum. And then the experience with, with the Snowden that uh, if, if it wasn't uh, for uh, the US putting pressure on everyone and on all airplanes and air, airspace of a Latin American countries granting, offering him, come here, stay here, we are going to protect you. And for me, it became really, really relevant, not only uh, focus on protecting the legal, the policy, uh, but these people, these disruptors, these innovators that are seen like 10 miles ahead of us. I mean, they are like, a, it's like this, uh, this, uh, uh, really special people that come here to shake things up. And if we do not protect these kind of di dissidents, these kind of innovators that are like using, taking technology in their hands and using it in, in things that we didn't even think of, if we do not protect this special category of people and we criminalize them and we put them on the terrorism boxes or on the uh, criminal, uh, criminal boxes, we will lose, it is not only a country losing. It is all of us losing. If, it, it is if uh, if we keep this obsession of protecting normality and protecting the average and protecting, you know, having all under control and this obsession of security and control and everyone behaving the same way. I mean, we are like a. Is this is this a scary how society is uh, is looking so similar everywhere. If I speak with a student here and I speak with a student in, uh, in rural Guatemala, there's not so many variations. And I don't, I'm not sure whether that's a good or bad thing. But uh, these remarkable individuals that are, uh, that are like, um, yeah, from Julian Assange to Ed Snowden to many uh, others that are in prison uh, because of their actions uh, using new technologies, we will lose big time. And I think that. Uh, 
a society uh, uh, that depend that really depends on uh, social collaboration and networks of solidarity. I am part of the Courage Foundation, that is the foundation uh, helping um, Ed Snowden Defense Fund. And what we saw is that the uh, human rights institutions uh, have their hands tied to help these kind of people. They cannot because of their funding, because of their bylaws, because of different things, politics, and so on. Oh, yes, they can help the orphans in Burundi, but they cannot uh, help the dissident in their city exposing corruption. So it is up to us. And sometimes it's something as small as, OK, I have a, I have a spare room. I, we need to get this dissident out quickly. We need uh, some place near the airport where this person can spend the night. Oh, well, actually, my grandmother has a house near the airport. Maybe she can. You know, these solidarity networks that we saw it uh, in operation during the 70s and 80s in, uh, to, to get Latin Americans out or uh, people out, uh, that worked. That worked. It was offering a meal, offering a place, a safe place to stay, a safe place to even recover. Uh, and that, if we put it in the technology space, it can be a safe server where to host my information. Or it can be. Um, I help you to have uh, the, the website up, or these kind of small actions that anyone, I mean, if you have zero uh, tech skills, you can still translate. You can still uh, uh, organize uh, a meal for those working uh, nonstop to, like, uh, for example, publish information that is uh, around corruption, these small actions. And the second thing on the, on the sorry, I, I got diverted, but it is very important. And uh, the second thing I will say is um, the possibility, we, we should defend and support the possibility of those in power to do the things in a different way. If uh, uh, the mayor, Ada Colau, comes up with innovative ideas and experiments, social experiments to do uh, technology in a different way, instead of uh, or criticizing the tiny little small details of new initiatives, try to contribute and support the, uh, those. Because big media, big corporations, and, and the opposition will be like crucifying her. So if it is aligned with your principles, hack it in a sense of make it better, and don't crush it before it starts. Next, Jeremy, Jeremy Malcolm from EFF. Uh, EFF is the venerable grandmother of all struggles on the internet. Uh, what's, what's up on the other side of the Atlantic? What's your, what's your vision for a bright future? Uh, well, I've just uh, thrown out what I was going to say after hearing Jamie, so I'm going to follow on from what he's said instead. And uh, so, excuse me, speaking extempore, it may be uh, rather incoherent. But um, uh, Jamie sort of um, struck, got a, uh, hit the nail on the head when he, he said that the processes of trade negotiation that are dealing with internet-related issues nowadays um, are, are totally corrupt. The, the trade negotiations, of course, used to be just about trade, um, the exchange of goods and services uh, across borders, and uh, they've put in firstly IP uh, from the TRIPS agreement onwards, so IP has been a part of trade agreements, but then now also uh, the free flow of information across borders, which involves issues of data protection and privacy. Um, also uh, net neutrality is, is being featured in trade agreements such as TISA. Um, also, um, you know, export of encryption technologies, also um, uh, a, ho a whole range of um, like um, issues related to the information society across almost everything you can imagine is now finding its way into these closed and secretive trade agreements. And um, we've tried to play by the rules since since day one of the TPP. We actually knocked on the door of the um, U.S. trade representative and, and said, "Okay, how can we participate?" And uh, they said, "Okay, we'll send your submissions here, or you have three minutes to present in front of the negotiators." And uh, we would give our like three-minute presentations, and um, it soon became obvious that this was self-defeating and, and hopeless um, because the process was structurally designed to minimize our involvement and to exclude us and we really just had this veneer of participation that was false 
and uh, they were wasting our time. They were deliberately wasting our time in, in having us expend energy that was going nowhere. Um, and this is exactly what we found, because when the final text was released, we found indeed all of the things that we were advocating for, such as fair use, such as uh, restrict limiting the copyright terms to, to where they are, um, rather than expanding them, such as uh, uh, limiting uh, the abuse of DRM, all of these things were disregarded, and the lobbyists from Hollywood and pharmaceutical industries and so on got what they wanted. Um, so, so for the future, well, th thank you for putting me back on track. So I think we need to stop playing totally within the system. I, now, to some extent, to, to some extent we, we have been doing this, and when Renata was talking about WikiLeaks, obviously WikiLeaks has made an enormous difference to the state of public knowledge of these trade agreements, and without those leaks of text, we would be even further behind the eight ball than we are. Um, but to some extent, that is a... Uh, agenda of resistance, which is fine, which is good, but what about promoting a positive agenda? I think we can promote a positive agenda to some extent through technology and through norms and through the things that um, Jeremy was describing, but if we want to have a positive legal agenda, like a positive agenda for uh, instruments to replace trade agreements or to where we can talk about internet related like issues, democracy? yeah, in a democratic way, um, which trade agreements are not. Um, then we need to start challenging the process of these trade agreements head on. And so that's my vision for the future. For the next five years, I think we need to delegitimize these trade agreements to demolish them, to actually um, prove to um, our democratic representatives that these systems are invalid and, uh, and, uh, and un unacceptable. And so that's my vision for the next five years. We have a few um, ideas, uh, a few project ideas in our heads about how we're going to do this, which institutions we're going to partner with, um, what kind of uh, really high-level decisions need to be made to, to get this to happen. So watch this space, but um, that would be my hope that uh, 10 years from now we'll look back at these trade agreements and we'll think, how did we let this happen? Why did we ever think that this was legitimate? And, and we'll have a much better democratic, um, transparent process um, in, in place of uh, what, we've had, what we've got now. Thanks. <laughs> Now for Edry, uh, Diego. Uh, I, I admire uh, Edry and I'm very much grateful for all the soul crushing work you do by being in contact with the institutions, trying to get something out of them and enable everyone around to try and hack uh, the institution. Uh, I, maybe you want to share some of your frustrations <laughs> regarding to that, but even more importantly, yeah, about your, your, your vision for what can be done for Adrian, for everyone uh, in the future? Uh, well, uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, it's a difficult task when Jeremy told me to, to start talking about the future because I'm one of those who are focused on very short term on the next regulation on data protection, on the PNR directive, on the, on the, um, on the copyright uh, reform, which is coming up uh, next year. So for me, thinking in the five, 10 year goal is very, very difficult. We have a five year uh, plan in, in Edris. It sounds a bit Stalinist, but it's not. Uh, but that's and the further I, I can get. Um, Generally speaking, I, I think uh, from what we heard before, uh, uh, I work on data protection and surveillance and, and, and IP. I'm going to focus on surveillance. Uh, privacy is not uh, about hiding. Privacy is about freedom of expression. And we need to exercise this freedom of expression by also exercising privacy. Both are interlinked and both are connected. Um, in order to do, to do this, how, how do we uh, show citizens that this is important? We need to have a um, to construct a global discourse on surveillance. We need to stop uh, talking about specific elements like PNR, like data protection, like uh, surveillance on uh, mobile devices, like uh, censorship in Twitter. And that's one of, uh, one of the guilty ones who do these kind of things, uh, going to specific points. But we need to find some way. I don't know how to do it, so please help me out with that. To find a, a global discourse on this is a, a overall strategy of uh, construct.
constructing some sort of Orwellian uh, state, and we need to fight it uh, as a whole, as, as a, with a strategy, uh, and with the long term. So we need to go from inaction to action. I, I, am, I was very happy to see this morning how uh, in the fight against corruption, uh, people were, we passed, uh, I also f come from the Spanish state, I, I'm from Andalusia uh, originally, and then I remember how we were used to talk about uh, oh, geez, the envelopes, or back then the, 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 the briefing cases with money, with the politicians, but you know, this is Spain, you know how we are. And one, one day we said, uh, this is not right, this is not uh, regular, this is corruption, this is like a third world uh, state in the European Union, we need to stop this. And people gathered together, they started doing the strategies, uh, at the, uh, thanks to the internet partially, and then, and then they fought back. So we need to do this also in the, in, in the field of surveillance. Uh, to do this, and, and since I'm um, based in Brussels, I'm uh, locked in what we call the EU bubble, uh, we need to find some way to, to feed each other. So those of you who do uh, activism in the local level, the national level, you need to help us to, to bring the voice, so that means sometimes contacting your permanent representation, which means the representation of your member state in Brussels, and that also means that you need to call, uh, don't be shy, and call your MEP, your uh, parliamentary, uh, um, European uh, Parliament, uh, Parliamentary Europeo, in, in Brussels, and, uh, and tell them to vote against or in favor of uh, one, uh, one uh, regulation or one uh, uh, policy paper. And, and the other way around, we also need to connect more from the EU bubble. We need to stop being locked in the, around the European Parliament and around the, the, the lobbyists. And we need also to connect more with the local networks like La Quadrature, XNet, or any other this organization who, who do fantastic work at the local and national level. And I think that's one of the other ways for the future. Last but not least, Thomas Löninger. from this young generation of activists we should really be proud of. That makes me happy that I, makes me feel comfortable that I retired as a full-time paid activist because he's doing the job, basically. He's been, and he's too modest to say, probably the most influential activist on net neutrality in those last years in the EU. What's your vision for a bright future? Hmm. Uh, honestly, uh, first I want to say that I hope you come back Retirement? No, no, no. One day you will. One day you will. They always do in every good action movie. Um, yeah, I have three points. I, I want to start, of course, with net neutrality. Although the vote is is uh, has happened on Tuesday, and uh, amendments that we were fighting for didn't reach a majority, um, the fight is still not over yet. I mean, we got a text, as Jeremy said, which is workable, although quite ambiguous. The fight definitely continues in Europe, and it becomes more local. So in a way, it's, it's, it's good that we speak about this subject here, because now we have to um, draw attention to the real violations of network neutrality, to all the dirty stuff that internet providers do in their networks. Uh, we have to make these things more transparent. We have to create data sets about these things so that we have the argumentation basis to push for reform and also to um, hold our regulators accountable to regulate and to enforce net neutrality based on the law that we have. And um, don't fall in despair. I mean, the US also needed two approaches to get it right. The first net neutrality rules of the US were not even applicable to mobile networks. So these things maybe need time, and maybe we are a little bit behind when it comes to net neutrality in Europe. At the same time, we are quite ahead when it comes to data protection. We have in Europe, with the Charter of Fundamental Rights, really one of the best legal bases for litigation, for court cases. Um, Max Schrems, of course, is a famous example about that. Also, the court case against data retention, uh, for which my organization, my employer, was part of. We were plaintiffs in the original complaints together with Digital Rights Ireland. And that led to the abolishment of the data retention directive. And that was the first time ever that the European High Court abolished a whole European law completely. So not just do repairs here and there, but no, strike it down, it's void. And we have this charter of fundamental rights. We cannot forget that. Like This is one of the best strategic advantages that, that we could hope for. Now we just have to fight that this also means something. Now we have to fight for the letter of the law. But instead of other subjects like with, with copyright or net neutrality, where we just want to establish the principles that 
would guide uh, um, an equal and balanced um, digital society. When it comes to privacy, we at least have it on the fundamental level, and we should make that more applicable. Um, that also leads me to my third and last point, going to the offensive against the surveillance state. And going to the offensive doesn't mean that you throw away your phone and no longer use technology, no. It means that we have to come up with a vision against this never-ending addiction of our states for surveillance. More data, more surveillance, more wiretapping, more PNR, just creating a bigger haystack in the hope that you would find some sort of terrorism and threat. We have to come up with other models, like how do we actually make our society more secure? Security and freedom are both legitimate interests and they have to be balanced. How do we actually balance them? There are ways. It's exactly what the High Court does when it evaluates a surveillance law. It checks through all the data available. It uh, hears all the arguments from both sides. It looks where did it help, where didn't it help, what is, is it proportional, are there maybe less intrusive measures that would do the same, would have the same effect. Um, we have to come up with a concept for a full surveillance evaluation. So that Tornos, Masic, and, and every year, every two years, we go through all the surveillance legislation in one country and try to assess whether or not it's still in line and still balanced on, on the foot of the Constitution. Um, such scientific concepts have to be uh, created. We have several uh, judgments from Germany that show exactly this direction. Now we have them more applicable. We have to come up with clear visions on what is the alternative to the surveillance state and how do we cement this balance. Because I think France is the best example that no matter if it's <laughs> helpful or not, like they always want more. And it's really an addiction to which we have to find an alternative and then push for this vision. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Estelle, you want to, to add something? Maybe Estelle from uh, Access Now, uh, which doesn't just send spam. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So I work from the Brussels office really closely with uh, Edry and um, actually our plan for the future I think uh, comes from a discussion I had with Reho from Bits of Freedom yesterday. It's it's um, hard from our work to, to show how much we do in Brussels because most of our job is actually preventing bad things from happening or making worse things less bad. But we should be doing more in pushing for good alternative and good things from happening. And it's honestly really sad to see that the only institution protecting our rights in Europe is the court. So the legislators are completely failing us. And we need to retake the, um, the power there. The parliament has fought for many, many years to get a voice, to get a power, and as soon as it got it, it completely forgot about it. And it's pushing from time to time for great non-binding legislation, for great report that make a lot of fuss in the press, but when it comes to have like, real laws and protecting rights, they completely fail, and we have to wait for five or eight years until the courts finally protect our rights, and we have to stop with that. So we need to regain that, and for that, there is the issue that Brussels is too far from the people, and we are sometimes so much in this bubble that, uh, Diego talked about that we need the input from outside, but we also need to be better in our place to communicate also what happened. So maybe more spamming, I'm sorry, <laughs> to, let, <laughs> to let you know what's going on. But we really need to read.